right? So today we are going to work with things that we need to memorize. There's a lot of stuff that you need to memorize for your ATP, for MCQs, because your assessment objectives for CAEs are assessment objective one is all about uh, learning and understanding and learning requires you to memorize a lot of stuff. So we'll quickly go through things that we need to memorize. So I'll first start with periodic table. Like you don't need to memorize the periodic table, but there are things in the periodic table that you need to know. For example, you need to know how to work with periodic table. I, I spent a great time, great deal of time on that yesterday as well that how do you work with periodic table and how do you figure out the constant, the configuration of ions and all that from placement in the periodic table. So here it is, uh, the periodic table and uh, you understand the structure, right? You understand that the structure is basically you have groups which are vertical columns and you have rows that are periods and all of them are just telling us about the structure of the atom. So if something is in period two and group three, that means the period number tells me shell number okay so period two means that it is it has two shells and if it is in group three then that means that it has three valence electrons now that means that you can easily draw the structure of this atom without even knowing what the atom is how the atom is it has two shells so you draw two circles for the shells and in the last one there are three electrons so three in the last one now what about the first one it is going to be filled anyway. So you have two there. And this tells me that this is boron. It has five electrons and that's the configuration. The arrangement is two, five. Another way to look at this from the periodic table is that use the noble gases to figure out the configuration. Uh, sorry, this is two, three, not two, five. Yeah, so if you use the periodic table to figure out the configuration, then how do you do this? So look at the configuration of the first one this is helium it has two electrons in the last shell so that is the first shell that you have so the first shell will have two in the second period which means the second shell boron is one two three it's the third uh element in second period so that means in the second shell you're going to have three so that's another way of identifying the configuration from the periodic table let's try another example let's suppose i want to do it for silicon this is silicon okay so silicon is, uh, use the periodic table to find the previous noble gas, neon. So what's the configuration of neon? This is two in the first one, eight in the second one, and that is the configuration that you're going to co copy. And for silicon, it is fourth in the third one. One is sodium, second is magnesium, third is aluminum, fourth is silicon. So there you go. The configuration from the periodic table would be two, eight, four. So use this idea to figure out the configuration of sulfur and fluorine. Go on, figure out the configuration of sulfur and fluorine. So the idea how you can do this is that fluorine, for example, fluorine is in the seventh group in the second shell. So that means for the second period, fluorine is in seven. So it will have the configuration of two from helium, the previous noble gas and then seven in the next one. So there you go. That is the configuration of floating. Similarly, if I want to do it for sulfur, then I will look at two from helium, eight from neon, and then the next one is sulfur, which is sixth in period three. So I will take two from helium, eight from neon, and then six for sulfur in period three, and there you go. That's a configuration. Now we can even use periodic table to figure out configuration based on the ions, like the configuration of ions based on anything being in the periodic table. How do you do that? So remember one thing, if something is losing electrons, then its configuration is moving backwards in the periodic table. How do you, so let me explain. Let's suppose I'm talking about uh, magnesium. So magnesium is over here and let's say I make magnesium lose two electrons. So magnesium's configuration Right now, magnesium is in third period, group two. So the magnesium's configuration, if I write it here, magnesium is going to be two, eight, two. And if I move it two steps back, then I will get two steps back. I have neon. So neon's configuration is two, eight. Now here's the idea. Magnesium, when it loses electrons, it follows the configuration of two steps back in the periodic table. So you, you start at magnesium, and you want to lose two electrons, right? So go two steps back. 
one step back is neon, uh, sodium, another step back is neon. So the configuration of magnesium ion is the same as neon. It is two eight. And that's fine because magnesium has lost these two electrons. Similarly, if something gains electrons, then its configuration moves one step or that many steps forward. So if something gains one electron, it takes configuration of the next element. If something gains three electrons, it takes the configuration of three steps forward. So let's say same magnesium gains one electron. Then if it gains one electron, then the old method that we know is that it's going to get that electron in here. And magnesium ion with the negative one charge is going to be two, eight, three, because it has gained an electron. And that is in fact the configuration of aluminum, which is one step forward from magnesium. So aluminum's configuration, if you look at that, aluminum is two, eight, three, which is the same as magnesium with a negative one charge. Now, examiner tests this all the time for transition metals and for noble gases. So for example, if you look at the configuration of noble gases, then neon is 2, 8. Then anything that is able to come to neon should gain or lose that many electrons. So for example, how many electrons should magnesium lose to become like neon? Two, because magnesium is two step beyond neon. How many electrons should nitrogen gain to become like nitrogen, uh, become like neon? Three, because neon is three steps forward from nitrogen. Okay, so that is how you can use periodic table to figure out the configuration of different ions. How about configuration of iron 2? So iron 2 is iron 2 plus. So the configuration of iron 2 and they use it in periodic uh, in MCQs that which of these has the same configuration as iron 2. Now, of course, being, being in O levels, you don't know what the configuration of iron is because iron is beyond uh, 20 electrons, and you just need to know atomic structure of the first 20 elements. But you can still use this idea to answer those MCQs. So if they say, what is what is the substance that has same configuration as iron with a positive two charge? Just go back to the periodic table. What is two steps back from iron? One, two, that is chromium. So iron two has the same configuration as chromium. That's it, there you go. So they use this all the time and knowing that you move back in the periodic table when you have positive ions and you move forward in the periodic table when you have negative ions really, really helps. Now, the second thing that I want you to remember is the facts that are related to elements in the periodic table. So I'm going to give you an extensive list today. So make sure that you keep on revisiting them as we move, across, we move forward in the syllabus and you keep on referring to them so that you memorize them by the end of this month. So let's start with noble gases. Now, what do you need to know about noble gases? We need to know that they're unreactive, they're inert. And the reason for that is because they have complete valence shell in the uh, in the in their atom, you have the complete valence shell or the large shell is completely filled. But because of that being unreactive, they have different uses. So there's helium, there's neon, there's argon. So for helium, you need to know that it's used to fill balloons. And the reason for that is that we give balloons to children and sometimes the balloons can burst, but we don't want it to explode. So helium, because it's unreactive, doesn't explode. If we fill it with hydrogen, then it will explode and that can be dangerous. So we don't do that, we avoid it. Similarly, neon is used in making electric lights because neon glows when you pass high current through it. And similarly, argon is used to fill electric bulbs or incandescent bulbs. And that is because in the bulbs, you can have temperatures that exceed even 2000 degrees Celsius. But with argon being there, the tungsten wire that's in there does not react. If you had air in it, or if you had oxygen, the tungsten will react with oxygen at that temperature. But because of argon being unreactive, it doesn't matter. Similarly, argon is also used to manufacture steel. Same reason we don't want iron to react. So this is used to manufacture steel. So you need to remember that part about noble gases. Okay, now let's talk about group seven. In group seven, you have what we call halogens. Halogens are fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine. So we need to remember uh, how, what their colors are and what their 
states are and kundu which are pressure. So I'll start with fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine, and I will ask you to guess it for acidity. So fluorine is yellow gas. It's yellow at room temperature pressure and it's also a gas. Chlorine is yellow green. Now don't write yellowish green or don't write just green. Use the proper color, yellow green gas. Bromine is red brown and is one of the two elements that are liquid. Do you know the second element that is a liquid? Yeah, that's mercury. Iodine is blue black solid at room temperature and pressure. So do you notice that as we go down, the color is becoming darker and darker. So yellow, green, brown, black, the colors are getting darker. So we can predict that astatine would be black. Yeah, it will be black because as you move forward, move downwards, the color darkens. Similarly, we notice that the density is increasing. You have gases in the top and then it becomes liquid, then it becomes a solid. So we can predict that astatine would also be solid at room temperature and pressure. So that is what you need to remember about group seven. Now, another thing you need to remember is that group seven is diatomic. Diatomic means that their molecules have two atoms. So molecules have two atoms. So when you find them in nature, they exist as F2, Cl2, Br2, I2, and At2. Another couple of elements that exist like that are hydrogen, uh, oxygen, and nitrogen. So if you look in the periodic table, you will notice that they are basically forming an inverted L. So nitrogen, oxygen, chlorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine. This is an inverted L, this is a seven, and these are seven if you count them. And then you have hydrogen. So these are all diatomic. Okay, moving on. We need to remember a few things about transition metals. Transition metals, as you know, they are the ones that are transitioning. They're moving from one charge to another all the time. And because of that, they're called transition elements or transition metals. They're all metals, so they have a tendency to lose electrons when they react. Now, about transition elements, you need to remember one thing that they have variable or changing valencies. What is a valency? It's another name for oxidation number. And in the case of metals, it is another name for the charge. So they can, their ions can have multiple different charges. Now, that is not something that other metals do. Like sodium will always be plus one. Calcium will always be plus two because it has two electrons in the lost shell, it loses them. It forms ions with plus two. But iron is not the case. Iron can change to plus two and iron can also change to plus three. So we have a few elements in transition metals for which we need to remember the colors and we need to remember some of them being used as catalysts. Now, because of variable valencies, it offers them two advantages. Number one, they are useful as catalysts. So they're used as catalysts. Sometimes they're used on their own or sometimes they're used as a compound made from them. And secondly, they have colorful compounds. And that's again because they have variable valencies. Now, remember one thing, this is a chemical property. If they ask you for transition elements, properties, and they ask you for a physical property, you cannot write that it has colorful compounds. This is a chemical property. So we make sure that we write that. All right, so these are the chemical properties of transition elements. So what do we need to remember? We need to remember colors for a few of them. So I'll start with the very first one, iron. So iron becomes plus two, iron becomes plus three. When it's plus two, its compounds are usually green. And when it's plus three, its compounds are usually red or red brown. Think of red apples. They have iron three in them. Think of iron two being in green apples because they have iron two. So when an, when an apple ripens, its color changes from green to red because iron is changing from plus two to plus three. Similarly, blood is the color red or red brown because iron is there. We have hemoglobin in our blood, which is a catalyst when we want to uh, transfer or transport oxygen from lungs to the cells, then hemoglobin allows us to do that. And that is again because hemoglobin, an enzyme catalyst that is working based on iron being there. 
So iron three is the one that's there and that's why it's red. Similarly, we also need to remember that uh, I'll give you a list of catalysts in a while. Similarly, we need to remember the colors for copper. Now copper can be plus one or plus two. For plus one, it is red, but that's not required to remember in O levels or IGCSE. So I'm skipping that. Plus two is for blue color. So copper two gives us blue color. But you also need to remember that copper two oxide, this compound is black. So that's something that you need to remember. Similarly, you need to remember chromium with plus three charge. There are other charges that you can have, but plus three is the one you remember with green color in there. So, so far we've done red, green, blue. So all the primary colors, we have seen them in one way or another in transition elements. Moving on, we need to know what their uses as catalysts are. So we need to remember four main catalysts. So we need to remember that iron is used as catalyst. So I'm giving a heading here catalyst and iron is used as a catalyst in harbor process and what it makes it makes ammonia or you can write to make ammonia similarly nickel is used in hydrogenation process and hydrogenation process basically makes margarine so it takes vegetable oil and converts it to margarine the bread spread that people use. Similarly, we need to remember that there are three elements that are in the catalytic converter. You don't need to know the names of these three elements, but if you sometimes get them, you can still, they're platinum, palladium, and rhodium. You don't need to remember the names, you just need to remember that they're used in catalytic converter. And catalytic converters in cars convert harmful gases to less harmful gases like carbon monoxide, they can convert it to carbon dioxide or nitrogen monoxide can be converted to nitrogen or methane can be converted to carbon dioxide and water. So all of that is happening in catalytic converter, a complex array of reactions and all of that is because of these useful catalysts. Uh, another element that you need to remember for uh, is manganese or V2O5, vanadium 5 oxide. This is used in contact process to make SO3. So sulfur trioxide is a useful compound that we use. Uh, so we convert SO2 to SO3 and we will figure out what uses are of these things in a bit. So right now I'm talking about catalyst, then I'll come to the uses and all that. So these are the four catalysts you need to remember for transition elements. There are other catalysts as well, but as we study, as we move forward in the syllabus, we will talk about them. Then there are two color changes that you need to know. You need to remember that manganese seven, which means manganese seven plus, changes to manganese plus two sometimes, and the color changes purple to colorless. So you have to remember that if you have manganese seven or manganate seven, then when it reacts, it converts it from purple to colorless. That's a color change that you need to remember. Similarly, you need to remember another thing that iodide, whenever you have it, it converts to iodine. If it does, there is a reaction where it happens and the color changes are colorless to brown. So that means if I have a colorless solution and it has iodide in it. If it reacts to make iodine, the color change will be brown. Uh, this is also used in oxidizing agent. That's another term that we need to remember. And we will talk about these oxidizing agents in detail when we study redox. So KMNO4 is an oxidizing agent. And similarly, you have reducing agent and reducing agents there's one that you need to remember, potassium iodide. So the color changes for KMNO4 are purple to colorless and for potassium iodide, they are colorless to brown. Now we talk about a few uses and one of the main uses of different elements is based on how they are in the air. So air, based on what you're doing, if you're doing IGCSE, then the values are a little different 
And if you're doing O levels, then the values are slightly different for you. So you need to remember for O levels, even IGCSE now, they have made the numbers similar. So for O levels, I'm writing it differently and for IGCSE. So oxygen is the second most abundant gas in the air. Nitrogen is the most abundant one. And then you have argon. These three, you need to remember their order. And for O levels, remember that nitrogen is 79%, oxygen is 20%. For IGCSE, the numbers are slightly different. We use 78 and 21%. Okay, so the rest of it is noble gases, most importantly, argon and carbon dioxide. So what else is there? Other noble gases. And CO2. Okay, so that is what you need to remember. Similarly, you need to remember the pollutants in the air that we have. So that's also something that goes hand in hand with human activities and obviously air composition. So you need to remember different pollutants. So you need to remember the source of the pollutant and how we fix it. So the pollutants are carbon monoxide and the source is incomplete combustion. So that could be car engines, that could be burning in factories. And uh, how do we fix it? The solution in cars that is catalytic converter. The second, uh, also its effect is that it is poison, it is toxic, it poisons. Okay, so that's an effect that you need to remember. Similarly, we have sulfur dioxide. And sulfur dioxide has a few uses as well as, as well as some harms. So this is based on combustion of fossil fuels. That is the source of it. Another source is volcanic activity. So that's another source of sulfur dioxide. The uses uh, or the effect is that it causes acid rain. That is a harmful effect. On the other hand, use is that is used in food preservation because it is acidic, so it kills the bacteria. And the second use is that it bleaches wood pulp. Remember that paper is made from wood pulp, so it bleaches it, it gives it the white color, and that is what we need in paper industry. So that's a use of sulfur dioxide that you need to remember. Uh, it causes acid rain and the solution is to uh, obviously avoid producing sulfur dioxide uh, in large quantities. Then there are two pollutants. There's nitrogen monoxide and nitrogen dioxide. You need to remember that they are also produced in nitrogen fixing. And what is nitrogen fixing? Nitrogen fixing is that when Gases in the air, nitrogen and oxygen, react at high temperature. And why do they do that? Uh, they do it because you have high temperature and lightning activity. Whenever there's lightning, there's a chance that nitrogen oxides can be produced. And the second one is car engines, because car engines have high temperature. So the air coming in can react, and uh, nitrogen and oxygen can react to produce nitro monoxide and nitrogen dioxide. What do they do? They cause acid drain. And how to fix them? Again, catalytic converter. That is what we need to fix them. Then we have lead, and that comes from uh, leaded petrol. So leaded petroleum products. And the way to avoid that is to not add lead to the uh, petroleum that we use. What it does, it, it causes brain damage. So people who are unfortunate enough to breathe it in or its fumes, they have uh, damage done to their brain, especially children. So that's why it's very, very dangerous for health and obviously for uh, it has high concern for that. So we need to remember this thing that why does it do that? Now, I told you about oxygen being this percentage and we use or in ATP or in paper one, they test it by 
removing oxygen. So that is, you can test it by rusting or you can test it by burning. So if you have a candle that burns, it will use 20% of the air around it. Or if you have iron that rusts, it will use 20% of the air around it. And that will tell you that, okay, this is the percentage of air around it. Okay. Similarly, you need to know that the sources, they are from the air. So you get these in fractional distillation of air. So that is how you get these. So oxygen for oxygen tanks in the hospitals or oxygen for uh, different flights or oxygen for fuel and rockets. We get it by fractional distillation of the air. Similarly, nitrogen is used to make fertilizers. So we get it by fractional distillation of the air. Okay. Uh, then there are a few other things you need to remember. So for example, you need to remember that N, P, K are essential nutrients for plants. Similarly, there is a thing called slaked lime that is used to treat soil acidity in plants. So if there is a soil that is too acidic and plants can't grow, we can add slaked lime to it and we'll convert it to uh, it healthier, higher pH soil that we can use. Now, lime family is actually very important for us. So what do we need to remember about lime family? So there are four compounds here and we need to remember all of them. So we need to know CaO, that is basically lime. Then we need to remember CaOH2, solid. And if that is the case, we call it slaked lime. And I just told you that it's used to treat soil acidity. Then CaOH2, when you dissolve it in water, when it is aqueous, then this is called lime water and is used to test carbon dioxide. So if you have carbon dioxide, lime water goes milky. It goes white. And that is test telling us that you have carbon dioxide. Similarly, you need to remember that CaCO3 is limestone and is used to make marble. It is present in marble, so it is used to make marble buildings, marble statues, all of that. And uh, it is also uh, useful in extracting iron. So that's where it's used. So these are a few uh, things that you need to remember for your, uh, obviously, O-level exams. For lime family, don't forget them. So it is used in manufacturing of iron. It's used in manufacturing cement as well. So that's also something you need to remember. Similarly, uh, you need to know that uh, in organic compounds, you need to remember the petroleum products. So we need to remember petroleum. So petroleum has fuel, obviously, and there are a few gases in there that you need to remember what they're used for. So I'll give you the name, refinery gas, gasoline, naphtha, kerosene, diesel, fuel oil, lubrication or lubricating agents or lubricating fraction, that's what we call it, and lastly, bitumen. Now, we need to remember the uses of these things. So refinery gas, it is used for camping. It is used as bottled gas for heating. So bottled gas for heating, for cooking, we use this. Gasoline, as you know, is another name for petrol. So gasoline is used for fuel for cars. Naphtha is also another uh, very important fraction that we get from petroleum and we use it to make chemicals. So we call it feedstock that we use it to make different chemicals. It's a feedstock for that. Kerosene is jet fuel. Diesel is fuel for obviously diesel engine and fuel oil is fuel for ships. It's important to remember that because ships 
can make use of this big molecule of fuel oil. So it is used in ships. It's also used in home heating systems. You might have seen those uh, uh, radiators with oil in them. This is the oil that we have for them. Lubricating fraction, as you know, is for wax. It is for lubricants, polishes even. And lastly, we have bitumen that we use to make roads. Similarly, we need to know, uh, this was petroleum. We also need to know that natural gas is mainly methane, like over 90% of it is methane. And we use it to obviously heat and all that. Uh, so this is what you need to remember for organic compounds, uh, uh, like the memorization part. Now let me go over a few of the other elements. So for example, you need to remember different things about aluminum. So aluminum, there are two things you need to remember. So aluminum, you need to remember that it is used, it has two uses. So it is used in manufacturing aircraft parts because it is lighter, it has, it is strong and has low density. So these two things allow us to use it in aircraft parts. Similarly, we need to remember that it's used to make food containers like tin cans for drinks and all that because it resists corrosion. And why does it resist corrosion? Corrosion is like rusting for other elements other than iron. Now, why does it do that? Because it has non-porous. Non-porous means that it can something cannot pass through it layer of oxide on it. So aluminum forms a layer of oxide that is not possible for water to pass through it. So we use it for that. Similarly, you need to remember uh, that aluminum. So this is aluminum. Then you need to remember about zinc. Zinc is used for galvanizing. Galvanizing is a way that we coat something with zinc and making brass. And brass is again an alloy that we use, and it's also used to make batteries. So these are three uses of zinc that we need to remember. Okay. Similarly, we need to remember that copper is used to make wires and cooking utensils. Why is that? Because copper is a good conductor. It's also, it has a good color, looks beautiful, and it's also very easily available. Uh, so we use it to make wires for that. Then we need to remember that iron is used to make steel. And there are two categories of steel. There's the mild steel, which has like, which is soft. And there is the stainless steel. And mild steel is used to make car bodies, machinery. And stainless steel is used to make chemical plants. and cutlery. Okay, so similarly, we can use more iron uh, or other things. You can add them to steel and that will create different things for it. All right, so that is what you need to remember about these metals. Uh, the other thing I will share in the PR table, you need to remember the uh, reactivity series. You need to memorize it before we move on towards chemical processes and chemical reactions. All right, so these are the basic facts about different elements in the periodic table that you need to remember, and you need to remember their colors. I will share these notes in the class. So that is what you need to remember for these. I will also share a list of definitions that we should know. I know it's a lot to memorize, so absorb it slowly, take your time, and uh, try to memorize different sections one at a time, and that is how you would know. All right, the last thing for today. What happens if you go down the group? What happens to the atom? So you're adding more periods. When you go downwards, like from lithium all the way down, you're adding more periods. So the atom gets bigger. So downwards, atom gets bigger. Now, what does that mean for the reaction? Metals find it easier to lose electrons because a bigger atom is able to lose electron faster. And non-metals, they find it difficult to gain electrons because non-metals 
need to gain electron are smaller non-metal is better more reactive a larger non-metal will find it difficult to gain electron it will need more energy to go that so that is why this is the key trend we need to remember about periodic table let me just write it down here somewhere that down the group in the periodic table so my was a different color for this so down the group atomic size increases that's the key trend so what does it imply metals become more reactive downwards and non metals become less reactive now why is that that is because metals need to lose electrons so it takes less energy to lose electrons if you are a bigger atom so the keyword is losing electron but non metals they take more energy to gain electrons because the keyword is gaining they need to gain electrons so it takes more energy to gain if you are a bigger atom so that is the key trend that we have in the periodic table and with that i will round up today's lesson you need to remember these things take your time i don't want you to very stress the whole right i have a lot to memorize take your time if there is any questions for this make sure that you ask those you can post them in the group even if you want and i will be happy to help all right thank you